just uh, want to especially lift up the family of this man that passed away uh, yesterday, I guess it was, in the motorcycle accident, uh, Jack Scott. I, I can't pray for him at this point, Lord, because I know that, uh, that, that he has passed away, but I can pray for his family. Uh, Lord, I just pray that if there's anybody in that family that does not know Jesus as their Savior and in a large family, we know that that's almost for sure. There will be some people that do not. That, Lord, through all of this, they will somehow see you at work in their lives and around them in the world. And, Lord, I just lift them up to you and pray that they will come to know Jesus as their Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, today, we're, we're moving on to John chapter 5 in our Sunday evening discussion of the book of John. And uh, I'm going to discuss the first part of John chapter 5 today. And I'll be going through verse 18, I guess, and then next week we'll move on further. But the very first verse you read is, After this there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. So that is John 5, 1. This is after the long passage, chapter 4, about Jesus meeting the Samaritan woman, and then the Samaritans, some of them getting saved, the noble man's son being healed. And in speaking of the order of the chapters here, of chapters 5 and 6, John Murray tends to believe that they should be chronologically seen this way. Chapter 4, then 6, then 5, then 7. The Gospels are not always in perfect chronological order, and that does throw some people off, and uh, a lot of times people of different faiths, different religions will try to say there's a problem with the Gospels because of the order, but that's not so. This is what uh, John Murray wrote. He said, The opening words of chapter 6 read strangely after a chapter set in Judea, but naturally after chapter 4. The Passover is near in 6-4 and may be present in 5-1. He further writes, The reference in 7-1 to Jesus walking in Galilee because the Jews sought to kill him reads strangely after a narrative set in Galilee, but would be in place after chapter 5. So that's John Murray's thoughts on the order there in the book of John. And by the way, uh, John Murray's got one of the better commentaries on the book of John. Um, Andreas Kostenberger sees this feast that we're going to read about as being the Feast of Tabernacles, all right? Uh, the Feast of the Jews. And I like the simple outline of this, uh, of this um, chapter, at least the first 18 verses. The simple outline would be John Murray's outline. The healing of the lame man. That is verse 1 through the first half of verse 9. And the second half of verse 9 through 18 is the turning point. That is the dispute over the Sabbath that arises. So we've already had the sign of the water being turned into wine, the sign of the healed child, now the sign of another healing here. We've got the lame man being healed. So I've read verse 1 about the feast of the Jews, Jesus going up to Jerusalem, meaning going up in elevation to Jerusalem. And now we're going to read verses 2 through the first half of verse 9. Now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. When whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years, when, he saw Je when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he already had been in that condition for a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Rise, take up your bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed, and walked. So we see Jesus around where sick people are. He's there. And we, we read about this story, and there's been a lot of questions as to what this was, the angel stirring up the water and all that, and there's been a hundred different interpretations. But apparently people could get well here, and so this man is looking for his only chance to get well. He believes it is getting in these waters. And in Mark chapter 1, we see Jesus out in the open so a man with leprosy could come up to him. 
See, in the last chapter here in John, we see Jesus heal a nobleman's son. Again, Jesus is able to help those who are ailing. He's there for them. In verse 1, we read that Jesus went up to Jerusalem. He went up to Jerusalem, and that means he ascended over 2,000 feet to Jerusalem. Jerusalem was a high city. In chapter 5, if chapter 5 follows chapter 6, this is almost the feast of Passover. And so some have argued for Purim, and one commentator argues for trumpets. So there's different arguments here as to which of these actual uh, festivals it may have been. But uh, it may just be seen as the sheep pool. The gate was added, of course, by the translators. But the name of the pool is interesting. Some manus manuscripts have it as Bethsaida. But we have here Bethesda. It's amazing that you know, in, a, in the state of Maryland, we've actually got a city by that name. You know, it's, it's interesting that we still, in a, in a country and in a state that might not be known for evangelical Christianity, we still have cities with these names that remind us of things. And the word in the Hebrew passage here, it's very interesting. It's a Hebrew word, and it's house of mercy. Beth, like Bethlehem. It's, it's the house of Lechem, or the house of bread. So this is the house of mercy. And this is where this guy is at. And it's a pool that sick people went to to find mercy. So this guy is looking to go to the pool. He's looking to go to this place where he can be healed. But what he's going to find out is he can be healed, of course, by the Savior himself, by Jesus. And a commentator named Morgan once wrote concerning Jesus' work and his healing on this man this day, he said on a human level, what Jesus did that day and what he said that day cost him his life. They never forgave him for what happened there. Because as we're going to see as we get to the second part of this passage, the story is going to kind of change. That's the peripatia, the, the point where the story changes, and we'll get there in a few minutes. But it's believed that the first crippled person that would get into that pool would be, hell, would be healed of their ailment. Now, you've got a man who's 38 or older, okay, because he's been hurt. He, he hadn't been able to walk for 38 years. So he's either 38 or he's possibly even older than that. So if he's congenitally crippled, then he's 38, all right, and he could have been older. You imagine somebody you've seen walk in the streets for 38 years, or not walk in the streets, you've seen someone, you know, on crutches or in a wheelchair, you've known them for 38 years, and they've always been crippled, always, they've never been able to walk, they've always been handicapped, and all of a sudden, they're healed, all of a sudden, they're walking, and there's a lot of healing ministries around today, but they're in front of thousands of people on television, and you see the wheelchairs come up, and you don't know those people. How often does it happen that it's a person right there in town that you knew, you knew was crippled from birth, and all of a sudden they're walking? These are the kind of things that we don't see happen because, honest truth, these modern ministries are, for the most part, fake. They're not, you're not really seeing these things happen. Now, God can heal somebody, but when it's Jesus healing somebody, it's not fake. It's the real thing. And in verse 6 we read, When Jesus saw him lying there, and knew that he already had been in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? He asked the question, do you want to be made well? And it's the same question we need to be asked if we're lost, if we're not a Christian. Do you need to be made well? Everybody needs to be made well. When Jesus touches your life, then you're made well spiritually, just like that man was made well physically. Now verse 7 the sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, but while I am coming, another one steps down before me. So the man explains the situation. He had no one to pick him up, nobody to put him into the water. See, the man is focusing on the pool. And we tend to focus on things that don't heal. That pool was not going to be his answer. His answer was going to be Jesus Christ. And see... What if he had gotten to that water? What if those waters had been stirred up? What if he had miraculously been healed? What good would that have been if he'd have lived another 30 or 40 or 50 years and not known Jesus? See, some people, they, they focus on the pool. They focus on the wrong thing. They might focus on psychiatry or psychology or self-help or motivational speeches or money. 
But none of those things are going to ultimately heal. So yes, had he got in that water, that might have spelled his eternal destruction. He'd have got healed. He'd have felt great about it. Hey man, this is wonderful. I've been healed. Who needs Jesus? And that might have been what happened to him. And so in this case, we see a man actually without faith being healed. You know, it's interesting because in verse 13 it says, But the one who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn a multitude being in that place. But as things started occurring, and he started realizing who this was, he started realizing, I'm certain, he realized this was Jesus that healed me. Well, what happens at this point is we move on to a turning point in the story. And the thing is, you cannot limit the power of God. He performs miracles in the presence of those that don't even believe sometimes. Sometimes a person has faith and they're, they're healed. Sometimes a person doesn't have faith and they're healed. But it's really bad when you get healed from some ailment and you can put the, the, you can put the, 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 uh, the credit anywhere else other than God. In the doctor's hands, in your own strength or whatever. Because when you do that, you're not focusing on Him. Well, let's look at starting at verse 9, the second half of the verse. And here's the turning point. And that day was the Sabbath. He healed this man on a Saturday. He healed this man on the seventh day of the week. And so you wouldn't think there's a problem. Take up your mat and walk. Take up your bed. Can you believe it? There actually was a law written specifically stating you cannot pick up your bed on a Saturday. You cannot do that. It's amazing. You're mad. You cannot pick it up. That's how strict the rules were. Well, let's look at the rest of this chat or the rest of these verses. Verse 10. The Jews therefore said to him who was cured, it is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. I've got to stop there for a minute. Do you think that just maybe one of those people might have known this 38-year-old guy or older who had not walked for 38 years? What's the first thing that would come out of your mouth? Wow. <laughs> Somebody you had never seen walk for almost 40 years. Never seen him walk once, okay? And you see him working on a Sunday down like at the local restaurant. You know, while you're there patronizing it. But <laughs> and you say, hey, what are you doing working on a Sunday? And they haven't walked for 40 years, but they're walking around waiting tables. It's wild. I mean, it's just, I would say, wow, exactly what y'all said. He answered them, He who made me well said to me, Take up your bed and walk. Then they asked him, Who is this man who, you, who said to you, Take up your bed and walk? But the one who, has, who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn a multitude being in that place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. For this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father has been working until now, and I have been working. Therefore, the Jews sought all the more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath, but he also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. The Sabbath, or the seventh day, which is Saturday, was set aside to correspond with the seventh day of creation. Because the seventh day of creation is when God...